we don't normally have the best squash crop ever, but this year has been a particularly good year. Uh, we tend to transplant all of our squash and we row cover it immediately. Um, about 10 to 12 days later, we tend to unrow cover it, cultivate over those beds as well as hand weed in between the rows while we can, in the row while we can still see that space. And we recover our plants. And we keep them then covered for another three weeks or so. Uh, and I think that tends to really give our plants a good fight against the cucurbit bugs, whether it be the squash bugs or the cucumber beetles. Um, from there, the plants are fighting on their own. And this year, with the nice spaced rains, we actually had a pretty late set on the diseases and had a really nice crop set. Yeah, we get the big clods off to try to leave our soil in the field, but no, we leave them in, the, in dirty until we wash them for sale. There's always powdery mildew. My biggest issue with winter squash is that it's ready and I'm not ready to get it in. And so it sits out there too long. And I think that's when we have more bug damage and weather damage. And we actually lose a fair amount of our crop just because we don't get it in on time. So that's really a management issue. And I'm learning to have a little bit more help in August and early September than I used to so that I don't fall behind. I've certainly seen frost uh, impact on squash. It tends to um, stain the outside a little bit. I don't know whether that has truly a long-term impact or not. The, the documentation that we get from Vern and other plant experts is that every night below 40 is not good for the squash in terms of its storage. And historically, we've had a lot of squash rot in some of the softer stemmed varieties, the kabochas and the, um, and the red curries and the uh, buttercups. So this year, getting them in a little earlier, we'll, we'll see if that had a big difference or not. And, We'll get back to you. We have a cool bot room. We keep it about 55 once we have all of our squash in there. In the summer, we keep this room pretty much that same 55 to 60, and we keep melons, watermelons, eggplant, tomatoes, and cucumbers in here because they don't actually want to be the 33 degrees that our cold food cooler stores. So pretty much year round, this room is 55 to 60 degrees. I just pulled out the last of our watermelon to make room for these winter squash because Normally I have about four or five bins of butternut, and right now I've got 10 plus bins, another two outside. So um, it's a great squash year, now I just gotta fit it all in. The biggest issue in here is gonna be air circulation, and I'm gonna have to put a fan in to keep it, the air moving around to help keep things happy. The butternut definitely lasts longest. We've had butternut into March um, or even April. The delicata go pretty fast. These buttercup or kabochas, I can't remember which they are, um, last year they really rotted pretty fast, so I've got them near the door so we can sell them faster. We've been growing butternut squash. and We don't grow like the whole plethora of squash. We actually only grow butternut squash, mostly for processing, and we've been doing it for 12 years. We grow mostly atlas, which is a very, very long day crop. And then, and then we'll do like, we'll always throw like a couple other ones in. We transplant all our butternut squash. No direct seed, so one of the challenges is, is that you need it, you need, you know, basically between May 28th and June 10th, you have to get it all in. And, and you can't have it be too hot, and you can't have it be frosting. So that's a, that's a big project, getting that squash in. It's also a timing issue, you know, you need to get in the seedlings at exactly the right moment. Uh, they certainly don't want to be, get put in too big. We do two plants and a plug every 30 inches. I think it was 40, 45,000 seeds this year. We actually don't irrigate our squash at all. You know, we have this bed form, which has been a great investment for us because it, it, it all in one pass, it makes a raised bed. It lays the plastic, it fertilizes the bed, and you do have the option of putting down um, drip irrigation. But we just find that we don't, it doesn't really, the effort doesn't, justify the end. Well, the other thing that's happened a lot on this farm is that, is that we've had to overuse our dry land. It's been so wet in the spring that we've ended up over planting the dry fields. This year we were able to open up a lot of new ground and, and get back, back into some areas that we haven't grown squash on actually ever on this farm. Yeah, anytime we can go on a new ground with squash, especially butternut does not like being grown in the same ground basically ever in my experience. I think as we get more refined in what we crop, that, that we're looking at six-year 
rotations. We're running about 750 laying hens on the ground in front of where we're going to be next year. That's made a tremendous amount of, that's made a real big difference. We had almost no insect issues this year at all. Yeah, it was pretty incredible. I would attribute that to the fertility. We were just talking about, about these gloves, which I think cost about 50 cents a pair. We buy them by the cases. Gemplers, 800-382-8473. Um, but they're knobbed. I believe I learned this actually from Tony Lahuye at Footbrick Farm. And since we're handling a tremendous amount of squash, we want to clean it in the field. We just find that it, it stores much, much better. Um, so just a uh, technique that we've developed is that we clip the squash Oftentimes in the morning when it's moist, we'll take lunch, we'll collect eggs, and then we go out and we actually just go through with the gloves, just give the squash a quick rub. We stand it up like this when it's windrowed, so it's standing up, and then we just go and we collect the, we collect, we bend the squash. That's cut right about where we like to cut it, which is to an inch. So. We need to leave that knob on because we, we peel it. So we need that uh, for the point of the peeler. A lot of people like to take it all off. It's a big on running debate, I guess. It's kind of moot for us, moot yeah. point. So. so no wiping, no bleach. No, no, no bleach, no water, no sanitate. Um, and you can see these bins, this is clean squash, so it's working. We've been on this property since 2000 and we've been growing squash all the time. Sometime around two, 2007, we had this amazing, amazing crop of squash and we had nowhere to put it. We had it in uh, our neighbor's barn, we had it in our barn, we had it in this below our house. We left a tremendous amount of squash in the field. So we approached the farm service agency and we we put together a business plan that revolved around processing squash and adding value to squash. They, um, they lent us the money for this building, which we designed for butternut squash. It's actually got radiant floor. It's got blown in foam insulation. It's a 40 by 60 foot building. The one piece that we still lack for this building is, um, is an air exchanger, which really um, we should put in. Um, one thing I've learned and been working with Vern with on the last couple of years is that we're actually curing this squash in the barn as we get it in. We only have about 24 bins in right now. We've been harvesting for two days. We're tracking towards about 120, 130 bins. And as we bring it in, we're going to cure it at 80 degrees um, for 14 to 20 days. And uh, ideally, you're supposed to exchange the air four times daily. Over here, you can't quite see it right now because we're making butternut squash donuts behind those tarps, but we have a peeling line. About 80% of the squash that we grow gets peeled. I mean, the biggest problem with this crop in general is, is what we've experienced over the last five years, which is just that it's, is it hasn't been coming in looking like this. It comes in, it's muddy, it's bruised, it's wet, it's diseased, it's, it's uh, you know, this squash is gonna store for a long time.